by introducing myself. I'm uh, Dr. Sophia Chang. I'm with the California Healthcare Foundation. I direct our Better Chronic Disease Care programs. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the California Improvement Network webinar. So I think I have to admit, Karen Lee, who recently left us, uh, used to run all these, and I am the total novice here. And so <laughs> I'll ask you to bear with me as I'm learning the technology, and hopefully uh, we'll get through this call in a nice, smooth way for everyone. Today's webinar is Improving the Ambulatory Patient Experience. And um, just a second about what the California Improvement Network is. She's kind of hosting this call. It was a, it's a group of, of organizations that uh, was started by the California Healthcare Foundation. And really, it's a network to share ideas about improving the delivery of chronic disease care. As part of our work, we host these monthly webinars to share better ideas in improving the quality of care, patient experience, and or reducing the cost of care. And today, in particular, we're going to focus on the patient experience. So since there are so many people on the webinar, and because we heard that terrible echo, uh, I put everyone on mute except for myself and the speakers. If you want to ask a question any time during the call, you can either raise your hand. So if you see... Um, probably next to your name, something called tools that allows you to raise your hand, or you can send a question via the chat function, and um, and um, both the, the presenters as, my, as well as myself can see them, and, and uh, we can pose the question to the group. Um, we're planning for them, for there to be about 15 or 20 minutes of question and answer after the presentation. If you've got a pressing question during, go ahead and raise your hand. And otherwise, we'll try to raise it, uh, we'll have, try to answer the question at the end of the call. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our two speakers today. First, we have Giovanna Giuliani, who joined the Pacific Business Group on, on Health in November of 2009. She's the Senior Manager for the California Quality Collaborative which is a statewide collaborative program to re-engineer care in the outpatient setting that partners with health plans, medical groups, and employers. Her work includes leading program development and training to support continued improvement of the patient experience, clinical quality, and cost efficiency. Sound familiar? Uh, Giovanna previously held positions at the Permanente Federation where she supported Kaiser Permanente Medical Groups in improving the patient experience she was also at Blue Shield of California in their new product development department and also at the Brigham and Williams, Brigham and Women's, boy, uh, hospital at their Center for Clinical Excellence. I have to remember all those old Massachusetts names. Giovanna earned her BA from Swarthmore College and also has an MBA and an MPH from UC Berkeley. Jill Steinbergie will be our second speaker and she's both an MD and PhD. She's really driven by a passion for solving complex problems and improving the patient experience. From 1995 to 2008, Jill was the Associate Executive Director for Physician Development in the Permanente Federation. In that role, she created and led Kaiser Permanente's National Initiative to Improve the Patient Experience of Care, which resulted in a 20% improvement in patient satisfaction and CAP scores and in the identification of some key factors in the physician work environment that can lead to practice excellence. In addition, she developed and directed Kaiser Permanente's National Leadership Program for Physician and Business Leaders and provided consultation and coaching to physician senior leaders. Her previous roles included being a practicing psychiatrist, an associate medical director for human resources for the Carolina Permanente Medical Group, and was a physician in charge in the Colorado Permanente Medical Group. So Jill is a certified, is a board certified psychiatrist, is a PhD in psychology, and is certified by the American Board of Holistic Medicine. She received her MD from the University of Colorado, where she completed her internship in internal medicine and residency in psychiatry. So I am going to pass the microphone, if you will, over to Giovanna to get us started on the presentation. Great. And Sophie, I know you had mentioned you wanted to record the call. I wasn't oh, yeah. Ready. And just to let everyone know, the call is being recorded. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, 
The impetus for this presentation today is a couple reasons. Uh, the California Healthcare Foundation asked Jill and I to co-write a paper on the patient experience of ambulatory care in California. Um, and so what we're doing today is uh, sharing with you at a high level what we've learned in our research and in interviews with organizations that we conducted uh, in preparation for the paper. And the paper will likely be published sometime in November, maybe December of this year uh, through the California Healthcare Foundation. So keep your eyes out for that. The, so the second reason, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about at the end, is that the California Healthcare Foundation is going to be hosting a conference on the patient experience in January of 2011 in Southern California. And so this paper was really done in preparation for the conference to kind of level set and give everybody sort of a basic, basic knowledge of what's going on in ambulatory care uh, patient experience improvement in California. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the background for the paper and then share with you what are the common practices and approaches that we learned about from the high-performing medical groups and IPAs in California. And then I'm going to turn it over to Jill to talk about what we learned um, about the safety net, uh, patient experience improvement. Okay. So I just talked about that. Okay. Um, Part of the rationale for writing this paper is that there's been so many interesting uh, activities in the past decade or so that have really focused on supporting improvement in the patient experience in California. The first that I wanted to highlight is that there's been public reporting of patient experience survey scores for some time, and I think California, if, if it wasn't the first state, was among the first states to do this on a statewide basis. Uh, today, those publicly reported scores are available through the Office of the Public Advocate, the OPA website. Then uh, the Integrated Healthcare Association, IHA's Pay for Performance Initiative, commenced, and 2004 was the first payout year. And part of that payout is based on uh, patient experience scores for the medical groups and IPs that participate. There have also been uh, steady improvements on a statewide basis in PAS and most of you, I'm assuming, are probably familiar with PAS, but I'll just give a quick background. PAS is the patient assessment survey that's used in California. It's a standardized tool that is very closely aligned with a national tool called Clinician and Group CAP. And PAS is used both for public reporting of patient experience scores and also for the pay for performance incentive payouts. Um, so you can see on the right hand of the slide, this shows the steady improvement that's been seen in the past scores over the past five years on these four key domains. So I, you know, this, I think this is very promising. The other, um, the other thing the data showed, which was very exciting to both Jill and myself, was when we first started this, we, we didn't really know, when we first started looking at the paper, we didn't really know if there would be organizations that had sustained high or sustained high performance over time on PAS. And what we found when we looked at the data was that there indeed was. Uh, and those were the organizations that we targeted for interviews. And these sustained performances, I'll talk a little bit more about how we cut the data, but they have shown that there are organizations that year after year have been at the top of the percentiles in several domains. Um, and the last bullet here, uh, we don't have great data. So in California, we have PADS that allows us to look across organizations to understand comparative performance. Um, the, at the national level, if we wanted to look at medical group and IP performance across states, we do have a tool that's used by a number of groups called Clinician Group Caps, which I mentioned before. Uh, but there's no publicly available benchmarking data at this time. It will be available at some point in the future. Uh, through the CAPS benchmarking database. But what we can use as a proxy in the meantime is that we can look at the CAPS health plan survey, which is really intended to assess individuals' responses um, uh, from their health plan, from a health plan perspective, how they experience their health plan and their member experience. But there are questions on the health plan CAPS that ask about their care. And so we can look at questions about the care experience and look at those at the, at the um, state level of, and compare states across. And so when you do that, we find that California has risen comparatively to states over the years, but it's still in most, on most key domains below the 50th percentile. So it's an imperfect 
uh, way to look at it, but it does give us some information about how California compares to the rest of the country. Okay. Um, why are we so concerned about the patient experience? I know many of you are on the call probably are already convinced about this, but and we offer a number of resources to support this in the paper, but at a high level, there's research to indicate that improving the patient experience is related both to improved clinical outcomes as well as to improved financial outcomes. And these financial outcomes tend to be improved because of improved patient loyalty, um, increasing patient satisfaction and retention, and reducing malpractice risk when you focus on improving the patient experience. Okay. So as I mentioned before, Jill and I uh, took a look at the PAS data, and we chose one question, which is the overall rating of healthcare question. And we looked at that question over four years. At the time, we didn't have the most recent year's data, so we looked at four years. And we identified medical groups that had performed above the 90th percentile at least three of the four years, and we looked at IPAs that had um, performed above the about the 80th percentile for at least the four years, three of the four years, and we um, conducted structured interviews with the leaders from these organizations to understand what were the common approaches and practices uh, that these shared that they shared, and we, we, that's what we're summarizing here for you today. Um, one thing to note here is that the IPA, as you can see, had a lower threshold. And this is something that's actually supported in the data and that we talk about in the paper a little bit, but that medical groups, integrated medical groups, tend to score a little bit higher on patient experience measures. And there's some speculation that it might have to do with sort of the shared infrastructure um, that medical groups have in place. Um, but that's just something interesting that we noted that was also supported in the uh, PAS data. Okay. So the organizations that we interviewed are listed here, and uh, one other important thing to note is that there were more organizations that met the threshold, but we didn't interview all, every single organization, uh, in part because it was, it was too many, but also because we wanted sort of a good distribution of geography and size and um, affiliation with a larger health system. So you can see the groups here that were selected to be interviewed and that agreed to be interviewed. Uh, so the medical groups and IPAs were selected through the process I just told you. The, the organizations that serve primarily a safety net, organi uh, safety net population, uh, because they, these groups typically don't participate in the PAS survey, there's no real sort of um, standardized approach to identify who the high performers are within the safety net organizations. So it was a little bit more difficult to identify those, group, that, those groups but what we decided to do was to um, interview um, sort of an informal network of safety, safety net leaders and experts and ask them who they perceived to be sort of the head of the curve or innovative organizations. And the ones that we settled on were ones that had come up several times in these conversations and that had also done well on various primary care collaboratives. Uh, that were offered either through um, CPCA, the California Primary Care Association, or through the Safety Net Institute. Okay, so I'm going to first talk about the medical groups and IPAs, and then and then Joe will talk about the Safety Net organizations. Okay, so what's the secret? What what do these high performing organizations do? Uh, we synthesized some great uh, interviews and themes into these seven, uh, what we've termed these seven uh, themes that are, that are shared across the organization. So I want to I wanna first talk about leadership improvement and, or leadership commitment. And I put this first because it's so important to any organization being able to be patient-centered or to be able to improve, it, it just can't be done without the senior leadership believing in the importance of patient experience and supporting it through every possible way you could imagine. Um, these senior leaders really believe that patient experience is integral to care, and they also act in a way that models the kind of behavior you would want to see from staff and from, and from physicians. They weave patient betterness into the fabric of the organization through human resources practices, through recruiting and hiring for service. They interview based on a service orientation for new jobs. 
They make it clear on job expectations, what the service expectations are. New employee orientation and training is centered around patient-centered care and patient experience. They put in place measurement and reporting um, uh, mechanisms, improvement and feedback to, to sites and individuals. And they also weave it into management practices through goal setting and accountability. Um, they really commit the time, attention, and resources, and so they're visibly out there supporting patient experience. And I'll give a couple examples of this that kind of bring it to life. Uh, at Scripps Clinic, the senior management team meets every Tuesday of the week, and they get together and they talk about what's working well um, in terms of emphasizing the patient experience and what they need to work on. And they, you know, they talk about what they need to work on not only based on the data, but based on patient comments and feedback from frontline staff. At Sutter West up near Sacramento, one of the key physician leaders there is really called, he, they term him to the face of service excellence. He is the person who speaks at all physician quarterly meetings, and he also coaches and mentors individual physicians in improving their communication techniques. These leaders also commit their resources. They fund uh, development programs. They fund the ability for people to become communication coaches internally, and they fund um, consulting teams, and this is something that Sharp Reese Steely does really well. They have a team of consultants that they can dispatch to help departments and assess what's going on in terms of patient experience and provide guidance to that department to help them improve their scores. And I think this commitment of resources can also really be seen in the level of autonomy that's afforded to managers and to frontline staff to be creative. And you can see the second quote here is from Marin IPA that the CEO allows the staff and management to be independent, autonomous, and creative. And this is really a theme we heard over and over again, that, um, that managers and leaders were really given autonomy to innovate and be creative in the solutions to improve patient experience. And you don't have to be right all the time, and it's not always going to work. Um, but the, the ability to sort of try different things and, and, and go through a PDFA cycle to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, the leaders also are the, are the people who lead the communication efforts that are related, related to patient experience. This happens across all levels of staff, but the leadership are definitely doing it and they're visible. And that's, I think, really um, uh, brought to life by the first quote. There is not a meeting that the medical director attends that does not address patient satisfaction. So it's constantly talked about, and, and that was from Scripps Clinic. Uh, the leaders also actively participate in reward and recognition, and we'll talk a little bit about more about reward and recognition later. Um, they monitor patient experience as closely as they monitor quality and financial performance. And um, in the IPAs, what we heard is that the commitment of the physician leaders and the physicians and the IPA leaders was also was very critical. And one thing that was a, a similar theme across the IPAs is that they really focused on how to improve the practice experience for their practice sites so that the physicians then had time to focus on the physician, uh, to focus, excuse me, on the patient experience. And so it's a similar, um, it's a similar relationship that, you know, staff satisfaction is related to physician, or I'm sorry, is related to patient satisfaction. And so this is looking at the practice sites and saying, what do you need to do your job better? and what do physicians need to make their practice um, experience better so that they can really focus on offering a patient-centered experience. And so some of the things that, the, that Valley Care and Moran and Hill had talked about was uh, improving claim submission, also working on improving relationships between PCPs and specialists, and looking at the relationship between the PCPs and the hospitalists and making sure that that was streamlined so that they could offer a streamlined patient experience. So I think the leadership commitment really, I spent more time on this than I'm going to on the other slides because it really sets the foundation both internally and also for what you're going to hear in the rest of this presentation. So the, the patient-centered focus really goes hand in hand with the leadership commitment that I just talked about. The organizations that we interviewed think first and foremost about how the patients experience care in that organization. It was very observable to me and to Jill that it was a very core value of the group. They really believe um, that there's a relationship between patient experience and clinical quality, and so it, there's a strong incentive to work on the patient experience. And they also have, for many years, used patient experience feedback to improve what they're doing. And it wasn't always available through a survey in these organizations, so they were able to get it in different ways. 
but they always used it to, to focus on improvement. At PAMPS, at the, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, one of the leaders said that they use patient advisors to give their input, um, and they serve on committees, and they come to meetings, and they give feedback to individual physicians as well. And so they really take that patient feedback um, seriously, and they have it woven into their improvement activities. Um, the second quote from Marin IPA, it's a message that's delivered in many ways at, at every opportunity. It was very obvious that the patient experience is talked about all the time at these organizations. <clears throat> um, transparent information is really, uh, we sort of termed it transparent information, but it's really a roll-up of three key components that are bulleted here. The first is that these groups have a very robust measurement and reporting mechanism. They uh, have a survey, and what's interesting to us is that all the medical groups that we interviewed and one of the three IPAs that we interviewed all used the press gainy survey. And the elements that are important to them that the press gainy survey um, offers, which may be offered by other vendors, is that it allows them to report at the site, department, and individual physician levels. And so being able to cut the data at different levels is very important. It provided them very timely feedback. Uh, the groups that we talked to were providing feedback sometimes, or formally providing feedback, sometimes on a monthly basis, but definitely on a quarterly basis. But that um, the press gaining tool actually allowed them to get real-time feedback on a daily basis so that the, the surveys were being put into the system as they were received. And it also allowed them to prioritize areas of improvement. So um, usually this is done through uh, an analysis of what are the items that are most highly correlated with overall care and the items that you're not performing well on. And so you can take those two dimensions and look at what are the high opportunities for improving your, your care, your patient experience. Uh, so really robust measurement and reporting, very frequent, and definitely reporting um, at the physician level. Most of the, all the medical groups did this, and at least one of the IPs did this. The, the second element here is that these results are communicated very widely through many methods. Uh, the leadership also plays a key role in this, in this kind of communication, and I think the Scripps Clinic is a really good example of this, and I'll just kind of quickly go through what they do. They send each site a, a packet that shows their scores trended over time compared to what their target is. They uh, post public posters at each site monthly where the patients can see how that site is performing. They send a weekly email blast to all of their sites. It goes to all of the physicians and the staff with their fiscal year-to-date scores. They also send out a monthly email to management. And then division summaries are sent out to all the physicians within that division, and they benchmark each individual physician by specialty, so if a physician can see how they perform against uh, their specialty nationally, and that's sent on a monthly basis. Um, the IPAs did this a little bit differently. It was a little more challenging given the, the structure of an IPA, but, um, you know, Hill indicated that their IP network staff communicates these results in, in person during uh, practice visits and that the physician uh, leaders within the IPA visit the pr primary care sites on a frequent basis and visit the specialty sites at least one to two times a year. And then the, the third component is that the data is actually used for improvement. So it's not just sort of distributed and, or put in a drawer and not acted on. Um, it's, it's talked about constantly in meetings. They're looking at areas where they uh, see opportunities and brainstorming ideas to innovate and, and improve those areas. The leaders share uh, individual physician or provider results on a one-on-one -on -one basis if providers aren't meeting the expected targets, and they provide um, coaching and behavior um, training to improve those scores, so there's, the support is really there for the physicians. Uh, Marin IPA and had a good mechanism for improvement within IPAs where the quality director will raise issues with their quality assurance committee, which is comprised of eight physicians, both from primary care and specialty care. And the committee itself will review the data and identify opportunities for improvement, but then also the quality director will bring um, potential improvements there as well. <clears throat> The, the staff engagement um, and provider engagement, I, I think both Jill and I were really struck by the robust nature 
of this. It, it was really creative. It was very deep. It was buried with, it within the organizations that we talked to. There was just a really deep understanding and appreciation that employee and patient satisfaction are related. Uh, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation mentioned that they've statistically proven the relationship between employee and patient satisfaction, and they've traditionally focused in, on areas where employee satisfaction has been low. Um, Scripps Health, the larger healthcare system, also began uh, their patient experience work by focusing on staff satisfaction, and they implemented an initiative that they called a great place to work, where they looked at uh, what are the things that um, employees are unsatisfied, dissatisfied with, and working on improving those first? Uh, so what you can see here are sort of the examples of, of staff engagement, and I'll just kind of go through these rather quickly. Um, the managers and staff are given autonomy, and I talked a little bit about that before. Uh, they're involved in setting their own performance standards. At Scripps Clinic, they had frontline staff develop their own performance standards based on what they would want their peers to be doing. They, like I said, talk about this data and, and, and use frontline staff to brainstorm solutions at, at meetings and so on. There's really fun, friendly competitions I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the next couple of bullets, I think Sharp Breeze Dewey does these really well. They have added all the necessary learning components that you that you want to see um, to new employee orientation modules. They actually provide competency-based teaching model, modules for every job that they have, from licensed to non-licensed to lab, radiology, business services, and so on. There's a really just robust ongoing training and skill development that helps staff maintain their skills, and, and, and they have the support to meet their job expectations. And they also do something uh, called peer interviewing, where they select staff who are uh, excellent at, at offering a patient, excellent patient exer experience. And those staff are asked to conduct interviews for new employees um, and ask questions about service expectations. Uh, I think, you know, our, our interpretation was that the physician engagement um, methods were tended to be less extensive than they were for staff. But that in some of the organizations, the physician and the administrative leaders partnered all the way from the top to the bottom. So at a, at a site level, you might have a physician and office manager partnering all the way up to a medical officer, chief medical officer, and a high-level administrative leader partner, partnering. And so that they, those teams worked, those teams worked very closely together. Um, and that um, there was coaching for individual physicians, and that it was talked about at, at, at ongoing physician meetings. Um, one thing that we talk about in some detail in the paper is that the IPAs really engage their office managers in this work. And so that was sort of the crosswalk to how IPAs focused on staff engagement. And there was just, the, I, both Hale and Marin IPA devoted resources to training office and practice managers, and they had a rotating curriculum and consultation on team dynamics and workflow. And they had, uh, Marin IPA has a quarterly office manager forums where they talk about um, the data and they recognize office managers who are doing a good job and they brainstorm solutions. So that's how it kind of looks in an IPA setting. Uh, reward and recognition was something that's sort of a natural uh, next step after, uh, after you've engaged staff and providers, which is to acknowledge individuals who are doing a really good job and going above and beyond their job expectations. And here are some of the examples on the slide of, of things that are going on. Um, employees will receive thank you notes or emails from managers and senior leaders. So on an ongoing basis, the managers and senior leaders are talking um, to each other to try to see who needs to be, who should be recognized, who's doing a great job, and they'll do handwritten notes or hand um, emails to those individuals one-on-one -on -one to thank them for the work that they're doing. Uh, they will also take the time to publicly recognize individuals at meetings or in, um, or in huddles or in newsletters or email blasts. Uh, there also was a lot of sort of going above and beyond or the spot awards that when you notice somebody doing a good job, you can whip out a Starbucks gift card and you have the ability to do that and recognize people on the spot for doing something that's really noteworthy. And there's also department and site competitions. Um, so a couple examples of these I just wanted to share with you were that uh, Marin IPA has an office manager recognition night called Night at the Movies, 
where they purchase all the tickets to a local theater, and the CEO attends and recognizes staff with the highest scores. And they also have an office manager bulletin where they acknowledge each, at least one individual in, in each bulletin who has gone above and beyond expectations. Uh, Scripps Clinic highlights the positive patient comments that they received through their survey um, in a weekly email, and they recognize people, um, staff who have been acknowledged in those comments um, through the weekly email blast. So you can see that uh, that's going on, that's happening on an ongoing basis. Scripps Coastal also had a, what they called an amazing race for patient satisfaction, where they gave away movie tickets and gifts. And the practice sites came up with really creative ways to reward and recognize staff for uh, meeting service expectations that they had laid out or for going above and beyond, such as assisting patients with finding a ride home or getting them a blanket or walking patients to their car. So you can see I, Jill and I are really impressed with how creative the um, the organizations were and how they allowed the site levels, the practice sites, to really come up with creative ways and giving them, and it, it doesn't have to be expensive, but giving them ways to offer small amounts of gift cards and things like that. Or even doing things in an email, which doesn't cost, which doesn't cost anything. And I think having the senior leaders involved in the recognition reinforces that it's important to senior leaders and that patient-centered care is something that the value, that the organization values. Um, so the accountability mechanisms in these groups um, were really interesting. Uh, so the groups, you know, um, engage staff and providers and engage in, in uh, improving patient satisfaction uh, first. They reward and recognize individuals, but then over time really have to have an accountability mechanism in place to make sure that they can sustain those high scores over time. And what we saw across the organizations was that the continuous feedback and the transparent reporting that we had talked about earlier, that ongoing system serves an accountability uh, mechan uh, purpose in itself. And so constantly seeing the data and how you perform compared to your peers or compared to other practice sites or compared to groups nationally um, really holds people accountable. Uh, clear expectations for the job and the support to meet those expectations, which is really critical, serves um, the same purpose over time. So people are hired for their patient-centeredness. They're given uh, behavioral service expectations. It's clear. They have um, their performance reviews are tied to those expectations. They're giving training and feedback to know how they're doing. Um, and one thing that we notice is that the managers are really expected to meet their patient experience goals and to, and, to, and to in turn provide their staff with a way to meet them. And so the managers are given a lot of autonomy but also a lot of responsibility to make sure that their staff are meeting the expectations. Um, I'm going to come back to rounding. Uh, some of the groups talked about secret shopper methods too, and you probably some of you probably know this where a manager might sit in the, or walk through the experience in the shoes of a patient and understand what it's like to experience care on that day from a patient perspective. Um, you know, sit in the waiting room or uh, walk through the hospital to try to say, or the um, uh, care site to try and figure out is it easy for the, a patient to find where they're going, for example. So just looking at the experience from the eyes of the patient and then giving feedback to um, departments or to individuals on how the patient may experience it. Um, I want to spend a little, just a few minutes on rounding because it's something that was really um, very consistent across at least the medical groups that we spoke with. And rounding is, is not a new idea. It's something, you know, that has been around in terms of care for a long time. Um, recently, rounding has been used as a leadership practice, most notably by the Studer Group. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Studer Group, but the Studer Group is a consulting group that focuses on improving the patient experience, and it's led by Quint Studer. And he has several books out there where you can read more about the Studer approach to improving patient experience. Um, but rounding is, is, in my opinion, really first and foremost an engagement tool. Uh, but it also serves as an accountability tool over time. And there's typically two types of rounding. There's ma manager rounding on direct reports, where a manager is res responsible for having one-on-one -on -one conversations with their direct reports um, on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, where they talk about 
do you, did the manager is saying to the direct report, do you have the things you need to uh, um, do your job well? What's missing? What's not going well for you? Um, is there anybody who you think I should recognize who's doing a great job? And the manager really needs to then follow up on the things that the staff needs to do their job well and, and, and to provide an excellent patient experience. Um, and that, that feedback mechanism is critical because if the manager is not acting on what's not going right and they're not giving the staff the tools they need to do their job correctly, it's going to fall apart. Um, and it, the manager in that, in that role is really modeling that patient experience is important to the staff. There's also what's called senior leader rounding, and Sutter West does this um, really nicely. They have a what they call a senior leader walkabout, where the senior physician and administrative leaders regularly visit each care site, and they talk to staff there, again, about if there are barriers to providing an exceptional patient experience, but also what's going well and who they need to recognize while they're on site. And this is just a really visible way to show sites that, look, the senior leader is a really um, emphasizing patient experience this is critical to them, and it's critical enough that they're spending their time out of the care sites talking about it. Um, so, uh, you know, I did for those of you who aren't familiar with the Studer approach, there's a lot of materials out there about it, and you can read books about it and go to their website and learn what they're what they are focusing on. Um, the accountability was definitely different in the IPA setting, given the structure that they have, but. It, it was very obvious when we talked to the IPA leadership that they really take um, ownership of having uh, an important role in quality improvement and that they're held accountable for helping the practices to improve care. Um, so they're not just helping con practices to contract, but they're figuring out ways that they can offer training to office managers, to staff, to physicians, and really trying to engage the practice sites in improving care. Okay, so my last slide, and this is probably not a surprise to anybody on the phone, but in addition to all of the things that we, we talked about, that I just talked about, which to me are sort of foundation setting, um, they create a, a, a culture of service excellence within these organizations. Um, the organizations also had really specific improvement and tactical strategies that they focused on to improve the elements of care that are most important to patients. And uh, what we found with those was, was that those are access to care, provider-patient communication, and also staff-patient communication. So the medical groups and, and the safety net organizations, all of them have implemented strategies to improve appointment access, and they were, they, they were called different things. They were called preferred access or same-day access or open access and advanced access, but they were all focused on making sure that the patient can get in same day if they need to for an, um, a sick appointment, and then also reducing the day's wait for routine appointments. And almost invariably, the groups monitored what we call third next available, 3NA appointment access, um, to, and they acted on the data. They collected it routinely, and they acted on the data to make sure that they had the appropriate supply in place. The IPAs didn't do 3NA, um, but they did do their own audits to look at days wait to get urgent and routine appointments among their practice sites. Um, one did a formal anal access analysis of the one specialty every month, so they would rotate the specialties that they looked at uh, to make sure that they had the appropriate number of specialty specialists in their network. Um, the provider-patient uh, communication is something that um, I work for the California Quality Collaborative, and when we when we help uh, groups improve their scores, we recommend doing formal communication coaching um, through uh, various experts that do these kinds of things. But um, what was interesting to us is that the, the same high performers that we interviewed hadn't, at least for some time, done formal communication training, but what they did have in place was coaches internally that can help individual providers who are struggling to uh, name and use and practice effective communication techniques with, with patients. And they weren't always physicians. In some cases, they were um, individuals who had been coached uh, by, expert, by communication experts or had been coached by other physicians who do a really good job. Um, one, one of the medical groups um, actually identified physicians who performed highly 
And then they ask their patients to identify what are the practices that set these physicians apart from other physicians. And then they laid those practices out for other physicians and said, look, this is what the high performers are doing. So it was really having this coaching capability internally. They also offered um, staff patient communication training. Um, but I think the most important thing here is that they first worked on, I, I think the communication training for staff doesn't work in a vacuum. You have to really be engaging them in improvement. Um, and then you can provide communication training within that context. Some offered formal training programs, but a lot of them actually just kind of developed their own internally through new employee orientation and training modules and so on. And then the IPAs um, had their office managers work with their staff to implement those practices. So I'm going to stop now and turn it over to Jill. And I'm going to be um, forwarding the slides for Jill. So Jill, just let me know when you need me to move on. Sure. Um, so Javon had talked about um, how we selected the um, safety net organizations or the organizations that serve safety net populations that we interviewed because there is no um, survey that the safety net organizations use that allows us to compare who's doing better or who's, who's made more progress. Um, so, so we're very aware that um, in our discussions with sort of an informal network of leaders and experts, we may not have identified all of the safety net organizations that are doing innovative work around um, patient-centeredness. But it's the best that we could do, and we found really interesting parallels and some differences between um, these organizations that serve safety net populations and the medical groups and IPAs that serve the commercial population. Um, and I'd like to say just uh, something about measurement of the patient experience because the lack of comparison data doesn't mean that the safety net organizations that we interviewed don't measure. It's much more difficult for them. They lack the resources to do the kind of surveys that um, medical groups and IPAs have. Um, and the, the commercially available measurement tools, um, there's some concern on the part of um, these organizations that they don't measure very well the kinds of populations that they serve. But each one of the organizations that we interviewed was absolutely committed to bringing the patient voice to the work that they do and um, doing it in some amazingly creative ways. Um, and and they, they range from San Mateo um, Innovative Clinic where they did a literature search and they identified the, sort of the 12 key questions that they thought would really reflect um, the patient experience, and they they hand did um, these surveys um, in um, at UC Davis in the Department of Family Practice. Um, what they did is they jump started their effort by having a patient focus group and really hearing um, the the real voice of the of patients um, in conversation about the care that that they were experiencing in the clinic. Clinica Campesina has found it um, difficult to do surveys um, or to do, sort of formally um, question their patients. They have uh, about 50% uninsured population and, um, you know, the rest are Medicaid or a few Medicare patients. And so they gather information from patients in a couple of ways. They have over time evolved um, group visits for discrete populations, and so they will use those as mini focus groups and use the patients in group visits to, to talk and discuss how care could be improved and how they're doing. Um, they also go to patients' homes and videotape them and sort of bring that back to the clinic for feedback about how they're doing. So that um, uh, I think what um, struck us about the safety net is that they are committed to using feedback from patients in whatever ways they can get it as, um, you know, the medical groups and IPAs that were high performers. Um, okay, Javon, I think we can move on. Um, 
So you get a sense that these organizations are that we interviewed are very patient-centered, and in fact, all of them had redesigned care using a patient-centered model, and they had come uh, they, they sort of come up with a team-centered approach that did two things. Um, it achieved continuity of care so that um, patients would talk to the same um, front desk uh, person, see the same provider, have the same MA, and the team-based care was very um, usually organized around pods um, where people were practicing up to the highest level of their license uh, so that there were, there were um, role changes within the teams and they were all focused on doing the very best they could for patients. So one was continuity of care and the other was um, good appointment access. And one of the things that um, we noticed about the safety nets is that they had very much a quality improvement mindset and they started their journey to improve the patient experience by improving patient care. And they began to realize as they tried to improve the care for diabetics and, and uh, other populations with chronic illnesses, that without changing the systems of care within the clinic, without sort of redesigning the whole thing, they couldn't provide good care because they couldn't get patients back in. They couldn't, um, patients were not seeing people who knew them and knew, um, knew their illnesses so that um, uh, quality improvement was really the focus um, and a much more holistic view of the patient experience in the safety net than we found in medical groups and IPAs. Um, and the other thing that stood out for us as we interviewed the safety nets was the degree to which um, leadership commitment was in the organization serving safety nets a shared commitment. Um, and that there was a group of leaders in the organization, not only the one that we talked to, but, but a group that shared a similar vision together and remained committed um, together. So that the, the quotes that you have are, um, about, you know, from uh, UC Davis Family Department of Family Practice, our leadership team is, is very tight. Um, from uh, San Mateo, we have a shared vision t talking about a group of leaders within the San Mateo Medical Center that had attended um, the CHC Fellowship um, program over time and sort of had developed a unified vision of how they wanted the, the medical center and the innovations to be. Um, the, the other place besides the CHCF program that people have developed a shared vision are through the IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Programs, um, and it's that common perspective and common language and commitment to improving the quality of care and the patient experience that uh, I think really provided the, the, the fire um, behind the changes that they were able to make. And I would... Um, you know, suggest that, that the whole redesign of the roles and the way that people work together was um, a large effort of change. And in San Mateo, for example, was in a union environment, and yet um, sort of the, the passion and the focus on the patient enabled the engagement of uh, staff to really create new roles and to to formulate a new approach to patient care that um, is working not just for the patients but for the staff as well. Um, so, Giovanni, you want to go to the next slide? Um, so, the staff and provider engagement was very much um, as broad and deep in the safety net organizations as we found in the medical groups and IPAs. Um, staff were actively involved in developing the new models of care and given autonomy and time to innovate. And I think uh, one of the rewards for um, 
this work is the time that that staff and providers were given to to create change and to, and to improve care. Um, so the new model of care provides a lot of staff and provider satisfaction and um, has actually uh, reduced the turnover that the staff um, and providers were having in some of these centers where um, where the new models of care were were implemented. You'll see a quote there from Petaluma that um, you know, sort of all their numbers have improved. That as far as they can, as they are able to measure, they show much improved patient satisfaction. But it's really staff satisfaction that um, for them is the real reward because there's less turnover and um, everyone is much more um, satisfied with with coming to work and uh, caring for patients and improving care. Um, the one thing that I think, uh, I wouldn't say was lacking, but is very different is the sense of accountability in the safety net. And um, rather than sort of clear accountability in terms of measuring patient satisfaction and improving it um, sort of down through the leadership structure, there is a sense in in the safety nets of um, that that have patient centered care of a shared commitment, a culture of quality improvement, and a focus on patients as sort of a self accountability and a mission um, for improving patient care um, rather than the the more traditional accountability that we saw in the medical groups and IPAs. So um, I think at this point uh, we have some time for questions, don't we, Giovanna? Yeah. Yeah, we definitely do. And so people can either raise their hand or they can uh, just pose them on the chat function. And let's see if anyone steps forward here. I guess in the meantime, I, I would, um, to give folks a chance, this is Sophia, um, I would love to hear from you guys a little bit more about um, what are kind of some of the initial steps, and we, you heard, we heard a lot about leadership, but were, were, was storytelling, for example, a key component of people being able to really share what this means to patients? Did that come through? Gail, do you want to answer, or do you want me to take the start? Um, you can start. I think, you know, I, um, yeah, go ahead and start. I was going to say if um, Angela Gandalfo is on the phone, she, I mean, she's one of the people we interviewed and could really talk about how they, they started. Well, I'll wait to see if she raises her hand so Sophia can unmute her. But I think, you know, when we asked the organizations what made you start to improve the patient experience, um, my sense was that many of what, what many of them said was that the leadership had this realization that they needed to work on it, and it may have been from comparison data, it may have been a competitive issue, but it was that the leadership said, "Look, we need to look at this differently, and we need to do something about it." And so there was something from the very top that said it was important for the organization to act on. Yeah. I think for the um, safety nets, and I see Angela raising her hand, so we should hear her story. Um, the safety net organizations, they were involved in trying to improve care to populations of patients with chronic illnesses and realized that they couldn't actually do that without addressing um, many of the systems issues that uh, are involved in patient, ex you know, improving the patient experience. So. Can you unmute Angela? Uh, Angela is actually not on the line. I see I her. Can't hand unmute her. Oh, I see. Okay. She's just she's on the web. In. I think she's listening in. She didn't call in. Okay. So, um, well, she probably called in, but it's not connected to her name, right? Uh, maybe. Angela, are you online? Can you chat me back? Uh, so, um, in the absence of Angela, let, let me talk um, about Clinica that has been doing this work the longest. Um, and again, it started with leaders who were trying to, who joined 
um, a collaborative to improve care for diabetics back in 1998 when um, there was funding for collaboratives. And so leaders who want to improve care were, um, you know, involved in the collaborative, and they, they realized that when they told patients to come in every three months and patients couldn't get in or miss the appointment and couldn't get in for another six weeks, that there was no way that they could actually meet um, the care targets or close the care gaps that they had. And um, so uh, sort of in the words of um, Carolyn Shepard, you know, it was then we stopped and focused on clinical system redesign. So I think, um, you know, there's something that happens in leadership that makes them realize that this is important, and it could be a number of different things. Um, but someone in leadership realizes the importance of this in delivering quality care um, or achieving a goal that they want and um, start, start the initiative. And also, uh, Jenny Anderson had a question on the chat. Uh, she asked if we'll be sharing the best practices discussed in this presentation. And yes, the paper that Jill and I co-wrote today, today is a high-level summary of that paper. And that paper will be published by the California Healthcare Foundation probably in November or December of this year. And then also, I just want to talk about the, the conference, Transforming Health Through the Patient Experience, that's hosted by the California Healthcare Foundation uh, on January in January of next year in Southern California. Um, and um, that conference is really uh, going to be a highly interactive conference that helps organizations to understand what they can do to begin improving the patient experience. And the California Healthcare Foundation is really encouraging uh, small teams from organizations to attend so that they can uh, have a shared experience in this conference and take that back to their organization. And I would and I add that um, uh, we've invited uh, to the conference as presenters in breakout sessions, so they'll be small, that many of the leaders that we interviewed to share the details of their practices so that if, if you and the team from your organization attend, you'll be able to, to attend breakout sessions and talk with the the people who we interviewed who've implemented some um, these successful practices. That in addition, by the way, to some nationally known um, patient-centered care leaders who are coming to speak at the conference. I have a quick question here before you go to the one that you can see, which was asking if we can share the 12 questions that one of the organizations uh, structured to, re to reflect the patient experience. I'm not sure which do you know which one that's referring to? Yeah, the, I mentioned um, the 12 question um, patient survey that San Mateo came up with. Uh -huh. And um, if uh, I don't have that on my chat, if, um, if if I know who that is, I can probably facilitate them sharing that. I will. I don't actually have the questionnaire. Okay, so I think that the person who requested it, if they could just email me back on, uh, chat me back and give me their email address, I'll forward it to you. Thank you. And then I think there's a question you can see about the consumer engagement. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, the question is, do you consider consumer engagement e.g. educating patients on how they can become better healthcare consumers, a component of patient experience. Um, you know, I personally see patient, you know, self-management and engagement and activation as critical to improving the experience of care and also clinical quality. But it's, I, I, I don't know that it's something that, that these groups sort of tackled early on. Um, I think it's something that I've heard high-performing groups talk more and more about recently and about how they can um, work with community organizations to engage patients in self-care and self-management and how they can be better advocates. Um, but I don't think it's something, it's not a theme that came up from these organizations over the past five or six years. Would you agree with that, Jill? Um, I would agree with that. So I'm not seeing any more questions, uh, and um, 
We are actually at the end of the hour. So I want to thank you both, Jill and Giovanna, for a wonderful, a wonderful presentation. It was really excellent. And, and to thank all of you on the line for joining. We actually have, like, almost 100 of you. Um, I want to remind folks of two things. One, look again at this last slide to note the, the date of our conference on patient experience. We will be um, sending the URL for the recording of this uh, call as well as the PDF of the slides out to those who are on the call, and it will also be posted on the CHCF website. And a reminder that next month's webinar will be held on Wednesday, November 10th at the same time, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, and that will be a call about PULST, the Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>